This video was brought to you by Indently.io, learning Python made simple. How's it going everyone? In today's video, we're going to be looking at five noob mistakes that a lot of beginners make in Python, including myself. Starting with mistake number one, tuples. The first time you learn about tuples, you'll probably see it being written as such. You'll have someone who says, okay, here are some coordinates and that's going to be one and two you'll notice that we will have some parentheses, a comma, and some content inside of it. And that's probably how you'll remember a tuple being written for the rest of your life. But something that a lot of people are not aware of even years later is that you do not need the parentheses to create a tuple. You can even create it without the parentheses. It's not the parentheses that define a tuple. It's the comma that defines a tuple, with the exception being an empty tuple. If you were to use an empty pair of parentheses, this would create an empty tuple. But in literally any other scenario, it does nothing in terms of defining a tuple. And a very easy way to grasp this concept is to just insert any value inside there, such as one, and print the type of this variable. What you're going to notice is that it's going to return that this is an integer. And that's because the parentheses are also used for order of operations, which means if we want to add one plus one before we divide it by 10, that's going to give us back a number, not a tuple. So yeah, that's just something good to know about. I mean, if you want to create a tuple with one element, you'll just type in whatever that element is followed by a comma and nothing else. It's up to you whether you want to use parentheses or not. Some people are going to find that much more readable. Some people are not going to care. It's up to you. Every time you print a tuple, or at least as far as I understand, Python is always going to print it with the parentheses. And that just makes it very easy to understand it's a tuple. So for defining it, it's not required, but when you see it as an output, it's probably going to look like this. Moving on to noob mistake number two. And this is a mistake that you will probably learn on your first day of Python. The majority of people I see making this mistake are people who have never touched Python code in their life. When you're copying code from a website and you're pasting it onto your own computer, many times your computer is going to reformat it, meaning that you're not going to get the correct indentation levels of the code that you copied. For example, here we have a for loop for i in range three, and we want to print i each time. If you were to copy this from a website, there is a huge chance, or I said huge, but, but there is some sort of chance that your computer might reformat it to look like this. And obviously this does not follow Python's syntax, which is indentation. Print must be indented to be considered as a part of the for loop. And I've seen so many people encounter this error, mostly people who use Python to run quick scripts in their workplace, but that have never actually written a line of code of Python by themselves. But it also happens to a lot of beginners. So while it is a simple mistake, it's definitely one of the most common mistakes people will encounter in Python. Up next, we have noob mistake number three, which is mixing up is and is equals to. Both of these are comparison operators, except they both perform completely different operations. And sometimes it can be very easy to mix them up because for example, if we were to have a variable called X, which contains the value of 100 and a variable called Y, which also contains the value of 100, then you will notice that we can use both X is equal to Y and X is Y. And they're both going to give us back the same exact output. And if we were to change that to let's say 90, they wouldn't have the same value, so it would return false. In this context, they do the exact same thing. And this is what leads so many beginners in the wrong direction, because they both give us back the exact same result. But now I'm going to change these type annotations to floats, and I'm going to add a zero here and divide this number by 10. And what I'm going to do above this is print both X and Y, so we can see both of the values. But watch what happens this time when we run the script. We have 100 and 100. Okay, sure one is a decimal and one's an integer, but you'll notice that X is equal to Y returns true while X is Y returns false. So this is inconsistent behavior. Hence why you should never use is for comparing values. And I didn't really explain why you shouldn't use is for comparing values, but now I'll explain the theory behind is. 
Right now we have two variables. And what's important to note is that they both have IDs. So I'm going to print the ID of X and the ID of Y. And here you'll see that both of them are different. And this is what's being compared when you are using the is keyword. So whenever you print X is Y, it checks the memory address of both of these. And if they are the same, then they are the same object. And that will mean that X is actually Y. They are the same thing. In this case, they have different IDs, which means this is going to return false. Now, earlier when I had X is equal to 100 and Y is equal to 100, this returned true, which for a beginner can be quite shocking behavior. And the reason this happens is because Python decided to cache small numbers for performance reasons, which means if the number is small enough, there's a huge chance it's going to share the same point in memory. And that's why X is Y might return true in some situations, but you should not rely on this because it can return false in other situations. To make sure it's consistent, always use is equals to when it comes to comparing values. So whatever the value is, whether it's 100 or a string or something else, is equals to will make sure it checks what the variable contains, not where it's located in memory. Mistake number four, not using if name is equal to main in your scripts. And to get started, I just want to show you that I created a module that contains a simple function. And I called this module my module. And all the function does is print that this comes from my module. Now, obviously, when you are creating a module, it's going to be natural to want to test the code inside it before you import it into your main script. So here we're just going to call this function, right click on the file and run it. And inside the console, we should see that everything works as we expect it to. So naturally, the next step is to go to our main file and try to import this functionality into our script. So here we're going to import my module and then we're going to call my module dot function so that we can use this functionality directly inside our main script. But now let's run main and see what happens. What you should notice in the console is that this function was executed twice, even if we only ran it once in our main script. And that's because when you import a module in Python, it has to run that entire script so that we can use that functionality. Even if we were to type in from my module import func, it would still run it twice because it had to run my module to get that information so that we could use it later. So with that in mind, let's go back to my module and see how we can avoid this. Because of course, one option would be just to remove this functionality and then everything would work as expected, we would only have one output. But sometimes you just want to leave that there because you want to show exactly how that module works when you are testing it. And it's not always the best option to remove code and then rewrite it later if you change anything. You might just want to leave it there. Anyway, to avoid this behavior in Python, we use the if name is equal to main check. And all this does is check that the script that we are running is the current script, which means if I right click on my module, this becomes main in terms of name. If I right click and run main, that becomes main. Whatever script you run directly is the main script. So if we do not run my module directly, this code will not be executed. The only time this will be executed is if we run it directly. So now this is going to run because name is equal to main. But once we import that functionality, my module is no longer main. Now main.py is the main name, which means the next time we run this, we should also only have one output in main.py. And even if it's the main script and you will probably never import it, I enjoy having name is equal to main everywhere. Because for me, that's a big sign that that part of the script was made to be run, whether it's a module or your main script. When I see this, I know that this part of the code was made to be run. And if you really want to make your code look like Java, you can even consider introducing a main entry point. And I absolutely love this. This is one thing I love to do with my code because using the main entry point also helps to avoid cluttering the global main space. So anyway, here we can type in function. And now when we run this, it's going to run main and check for if name is equal to main. So everything's going to work perfectly. 
And again, what's nice about this is that we can go back to my module, we can edit this, we can do whatever we want, and we can continuously test it without having to remove this each time. Maybe we want to do for i in range three or two, whatever the keyboard wants, I go with it. Maybe we want to do something like this, and when we run it, it's going to print it twice. And then we want to keep this test for future reference. Thanks to if name is equal to main, we do not have to remove this every single time we create the test and recreate it. It's only going to run this snippet of code if name is equal to main. And finally, one of the biggest new mistakes I've made in Python is mixing up class attributes and instance attributes. For example, you might have a class called car, and then as always, you're going to create an initializer. And inside here, we just want to give that car a brand. So self.brand is going to equal this brand. What we did here is create an instance attribute. And you'll notice this because we're using self, which refers to the instance. And an instance is a unique occurrence of our class. So if we're to type in car, type car equals this car of BMW, this will be a unique occurrence. BMW is going to be assigned to the instance of car, not the actual class. But there's also a way of creating class attributes. And to create a class attribute, you just have to define a variable anywhere in your class outside of the initializer. For example, we can type in something such as fuel type, and that will be of type string. And here we can just type in electric, why not? We're in the future. So we can also add this here. And if we go back to our car, which I'm actually going to rename to BMW, because I have to create a few later. But if we were to go back to our car and type in bmw.brand and bmw.fuel type, and I didn't print anything because I'm a silly guy. And not only am I a silly guy, but I even ran the wrong module. But if I were to run this script directly, you'll see that we will get back BMW and electric. And before that, we also have the option to change both the brand and the fuel type just by referring to it. So we can type in bmw.brand equals, let's say, Mercedes. It's somehow transformed. I don't know how that works, but it did. And we can also say that the fuel type is now equal to diesel. And that will update the attributes of the class. But one thing I didn't tell you is that by referring to dot fuel type, we are not referring to the class attribute but we're actually creating something called self.fueltype directly inside here under the scene. And the reason I'm telling you this is because back in the day, during my first moments learning Python, I thought this was updating the class attribute. And class attributes are supposed to affect all of the cars. All of the future cars that I create should have this attribute because it belongs to the class, not to the instance. And to explain that better, I'm going to create a second car called Volvo type car, which will equal this car called Volvo. Now, if we were to print, let's say Volvo dot brand and Volvo dot fuel, you're going to notice that the Volvo is still electric, even after we change the class attribute, which is in this case, the instance attribute. But to actually change the class attribute, we would have to change this to car and then change that to whatever fuel type we want. So that the next time we run this, both of them will be on diesel instead of Mercedes. So all I wanted to say here is that in the past, one of my biggest mistakes was referring to the instance and thinking that this affected the class attribute. While in reality, all it did was create a new instance attribute called fuel type and this would be exclusive to the BMW. Anyway, those were just a few of the mistakes I encountered when I was learning Python, and I hope you found this video useful. Hopefully it will help prevent you from making the same mistakes I made when I was learning Python. But yeah, if there are any mistakes you made in the past when you were learning Python, I would love to hear about that in the comment section down below. But otherwise, with all that being said, as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.